art um, is a gift from God. It's a means that God has given for us to, for expression and an outlet for creativity. Some of you guys are incredible when it comes to art and music. I'm grateful for you folks who have this incredible skill of music that can sing and lead us in worship week in and week out. But God was the first artist when he spoke the world into existence by creating um, trees that sway in the wind, oceans that crash their waves into the shoreline, birds that glide through the air. And we, as people made in God's image, we enjoy art as well. We enjoy art forms because we like being moved, inspired. We like to feel something outside of our normal lives. Art taps into something we feel otherwise would be missing, and it commands a response from us. That's why we go to musicals or operas or movies or concerts. It's hard not to be affected by film or by music or any other art form. That's why that's what we were created to do. It moves you. It changes you in some way, shape, form, or another. This week, me, our family went and saw Black Panther, right? Um, and immediately after leaving, our first conversation was, where did this movie rank in, the, in DC, I mean, Marvel movies, right? Um, trying to figure out which one was the best. And all my kids, all three of them were like, this was the best. This was the absolute good. They were moved by it. They enjoyed it. They loved it. One of them wants to see it again and again and again. And so there's something that moves us, inspires us about it, isn't it? And I say, that's got to be the same with Jesus. And as we study our scriptures, there's something about Jesus that has to move us. You cannot walk away from Jesus indifferent. You have to be changed every time you are exposed to his glory, whether you realize it or not. And in the Bible, we see people that come face to face with Jesus, and they're constantly being changed, some for good and some for worse. The prophet Isaiah, when he encountered the glory of God, he was undone. The only words that could come out of his mouth was, woe is me, woe is me. Gideon thought that he was going to die when he encountered God. Peter felt unworthy. Job was brought to repentance. The Apostle John, whose book we're studying, collapsed like a dead man when he confronted Jesus. And Paul, his life was transformed and he was set on mission to serve Jesus. And yet on the flip side, Pharaoh, when he encounters the glory of God through the miracles that happen in Exodus, he becomes callous. He becomes hard. Herod, standing in front of Jesus, grows cold. Pilate becomes cynical, and they just want, Herod and Pilate just wants Jesus to perform tricks and magic for him. You see, as you've seen Jesus through the Gospel of John, you've been changed whether you realize it or not. There is no neutrality with Jesus, for the same sun that melts the wax is the same sun that hardens the clay, and that makes Jesus risky. It makes him not safe. It makes him dangerous to encounter on the pages of Scripture as Mr. Tumas says to Lucy in The Lion, the Witch, in the Wardrobe, he's not safe, but he's good. He's not safe, but he's good. Jesus is dangerous. And to encounter him, because when you encounter him, something happens in your life. You can't just ignore him. You are changed one way or another. And as we've been studying John, we've been catching glimpses of the glory of Jesus week in and week out. And it's a stunning, convicting, comforting, uneasy, yet satisfying experience that is if you're turning to him and running to him. But if you turn away from him, your heart will become cold and callous like Pharaoh and Herod and Pilate. And then, like them, you will face his wrath in the end. But turn to him, and you'll find that this is what you were made for. This is is what you were created for, to see the stunning beauty of the glory of God in the person and face and work of Jesus. In our passage this morning, we're on the heels of one of the greatest miracles recorded in Scripture, Jesus raising a dead man back to life. And Lazarus was dead. He was in the grave for four days. He was dead as a doorknob, and he was already decomposing when Jesus brought him back to life. And Scripture says that Jesus did all of this so that he could be magnified. He could be glorified, not like a, teles not like a microscope, but like a telescope, and he could be made much of. And at the same time, 
This was for Lazarus' joy, his family's joy, and for the rest of the watching world because they at this moment could see the glory of Jesus. And everyone who was there that morning walked away changed. The religious leaders got fearful. Martha was moved to service and action. Mary, the sister of Lazarus, was moved to worship and adoration. Judas, the disciple, was moved to greed. And Lazarus was moved to living his life on mission for Jesus. And so this morning we're going to see in our text five responses when we encounter Jesus. Five ways that we respond when we encounter Jesus who Jesus really is. And as we look at the glory of Jesus in the pages of John's gospel, it will turn you either inward in fear, downward in service, upward in worship, forward in greed, or outward into mission. Three of those responses are glorious responses. The other two are damning or condemning. And so here's what we're going to see. Five things. Number one, we're going to discover inward in fear. The first response is inward in fear. Look at verse 45 with me of John 11. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what he did, believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. Some of the Jews who saw Jesus' glory in raising Lazarus from the dead run and they snitch about Jesus to the Pharisees. And you can bet that they didn't go and tell the Pharisees because they wanted, to, they wanted the Pharisees to throw Jesus a party, but because they wanted to get Jesus in trouble and they wanted Jesus to be taken out. These guys were terrified of Jesus. They were afraid of him. Jesus threatened their way of life in their religion, and in their mind, they th- Jesus threatened their well-being with the Romans because Jesus was causing crowds to follow him. And they were afraid that the Romans would come and destroy all of them. Look at verse 47. So the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council and said, What are we to do? For this man performs many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe him. And the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. So the religious leaders now gather in this closed-door meeting to discuss Jesus. They're all shaking in their boots in this, as this apparent carpenter's son just raised a dead man back to life. He's apparently more than meets the eyes and more than what they bargained for. And friends, that is always the way it is with Jesus. He's always way more than you and I bargained for. The council that they're talking about here is called the Sanhedrin. It includes this group called the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And these two groups couldn't be any more different from each other. The Pharisees weren't a political party at all. They were a religious group. They All they cared about was keeping the law and trying to make sure everyone else obeyed the law. They, were, they looked good in front of other people. They were the religious leaders of the day. The Sadducees, on the other hand, were very political. They were the group that were just trying to rake in the cash. They were all about being successful and making money. The Sadducees would be the ones that would be driving Bentleys and to Wall Street in New York, listening to Beethoven's Fifth, sipping on a latte. Yet the Pharisees would be the ones that are living in rural America, driving pickups with oversized tires and huge mud flaps, rocking out to good old country music while sipping on some good sweet tea, right? Um, Two completely different groups of people. And yet, strangely enough, Jesus proves to be a unifier, not a divider. He brings these two groups of people together because of their fear and their hatred of Jesus. And now for a brief season... These guys put their differences aside, and they work together to destroy and kill Jesus. They really need to do something about Jesus in their minds. Their previous plans haven't worked. They try to trick Jesus into saying something. That fails. They try to send people to arrest Jesus. That fails. The soldiers that they sent to arrest Jesus, they come back and say, listen, no man's spoken like this man before. We're not going to arrest him. They're going to have to step up their efforts now because they're now in even more trouble because now not only is Jesus walking around teaching, but there is a guy that used to be dead that's now alive walking around with Jesus. And the crowds are going crazy. People are being drawn to Jesus. So they have to discredit Jesus, drop his popularity rating, run his smear campaign against Jesus to destroy him. And you know what's amazing about the text when you look at it is these guys actually 
admit that the miracles are real. They're like, Jesus is doing this stuff. But they don't want Jesus. They see him performing signs. They see him raising people from the dead. But they don't want him. They've seen his glory. And instead of running toward Jesus, they run away in fear from Jesus. Fear of losing everything they value. They take stock of their lives. And they realize that Jesus is a threat to them. And this inward posture and contemplation has caused them to resist Jesus instead of being drawn to Jesus. You say, why is Jesus a threat to them? Why, is, why are they so worried about him? You see, Jesus was a threat to their livelihood. Everyone keeps following Jesus. It means that nobody's going to start following them anymore. That Jesus is getting a bigger crowd, and their people, their following is shrinking, diminishing. And since Jesus doesn't want to be a king, and since Jesus doesn't want to overthrow the Roman government, they're pretty sure that the Romans will come and conquer him and destroy him, and they're terrified. They're worried. What are they afraid of? They're afraid, quite simply, they're afraid that Jesus is going to take away their influence, their power. And as a result, they're going to lose their comfort and their safety. That's all they're worried about. And Jesus will do that with all of us. Notice the phrase in verse 48. It says, our place, our nation. They're concerned that the Romans are going to come and take away from them their temple, their nation, their position. They're not concerned about the nation as a whole. They're only concerned about what's going to happen to themselves. Seeing Jesus' glory causes them to cower in fear. Why are you? Are you scared of Jesus? Does he make you uncomfortable? Listen, if you don't know Jesus, you should be terrified. And even for those of us who know Jesus, we need to see that Jesus is not safe. His goal for our life isn't simply to make our life comfortable. His goal for our life isn't simply to make our life easy. His goal for our life isn't to give you your best life now. His goal for you and for me is to make you like him, to look like him. And that involves sometimes suffering, sometimes hardships, sometimes trials, and oftentimes stretching into places that we don't want to be stretched. He will mess up your life goals because your life goals typically involve what you can do to achieve safety and comfort and ease for yourself. And Jesus says, that is not what I have came for. See, if you're relying on good works, religion, morality, to give you a good standing with God, like these guys were, like these Pharisees were, then Jesus is a serious threat to your life because he's going to say that, listen, all the works that you do, all the going to church that you do, all the giving that you do, all the praying that you do means nothing to me. It means absolutely nothing to me. And he's going to say, he's already told these religious guys, these guys that are doing all of this religious stuff, this morality keeping that they're doing. He says, listen, you're dead in your sins. You're dead men walking. And he says that multiple times to them. Religious people don't like Jesus because if you're saved by good works, then there's going to be a limit to what God could ask of you and what God could put you through, right? You'll be a taxpayer that has rights to a rights, a say, a vote in how your life goes. You, you've done your part, and so God has to do your, his part. You said, God, I've done all this for you, and because I've done this for you, then you have to do this for me. But listen, if you're a sinner, if you're someone that acknowledges you're broken, you're messed up, that you need someone bigger than you outside of you to come and rescue you, then there is nothing that Jesus cannot ask of you. This is why he'll keep saying in the Gospels over and over, listen, take up your cross, follow me. When it's all grace and not of your works, then Jesus can command anything of you. And that's a scary place. That's an absolutely scary place. These people wanted to leverage God with their good works, and Jesus doesn't allow it. This is why in 1 Corinthians it says that, that no one may boast. You say, but God, you can't do this. Yes, he can. But God, that's not right. That's not fair. 
He can do whatever he wants, however he wants to do it, because his goal isn't to give you life and ease and comfort. His goal is to make you like him. And sometimes that means he'll put you through stuff, because at the end of it, you'll become more like Jesus. Look at verse 49. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was a high priest that year, said to them, you know nothing at all, nor do you understand that it's better for you that one man should die for the people, not the whole nation should perish. Caiaphas was the leader of the group, the high priest, the highest religious moral authority in, this, in the area, and he reprimands them and is repulsed that these people are fearful of Jesus. He basically says, you want life your, the way it is? You want to stop being afraid? And, you want to stop being afraid and feeling guilty? Then let's have Jesus killed. And when we kill him, our lives will be safe. Our life will be okay. He'll take the punishment for us, and we can be at peace with the Romans, and we'll, and we'll enjoy life. Jesus can be our scapegoat. Follow Jesus, and the nation will perish along with our jobs and our influence, but kill Jesus, the nation will be saved, and our jobs will be safe, our livelihood will be safe, and our influence will be safe. And in case you don't catch the irony, John fills us in verse 51. He says, he didn't say this of his own accord. But being the high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation, and not for the nation only, but also to gather into one the children of God who were scattered abroad. So from that day on, they made plans to put him to death. Dramatic irony is an effective tool in acting. It's when a character says or does something with full significance that he does not realize. And this would be like, the apple that's put in front of Snow White that puts her into a deep sleep because the audience knows that the wicked stepmother has cursed the apple, but Snow White doesn't know it. You see, it was true that Jesus had to die in order to save people, but not in the way that these religious leaders were thinking. They were thinking that Jesus' death would be a criminal's death, and because he dies, it would save them from all sorts of unnecessary pain and anguish. But it was Jesus' death as a savior that would save them. They thought having a good reputation with people, having people like them, having people need them was where life came from. If they could but keep the status quo, they would be happy. And the ironic thing is that they try to keep the status quo, status quo and, they, and turning inward in fear, they destroy themselves. They destroy their entire lives. Turning inward in fear of Jesus and trying to work things out for yourself is always hopeless. You would die in your sin trying to figure, work things out for yourself. You and I, we need rescuing. We need a new self. We need grace. And in order to get that, you have to lose yourself. And you have to come humbly before this dangerous, not safe Jesus. You'll end up destroying your life. And C.S. Lewis says, book, The Silver Chair, he describes a young girl, Jill, coming into Narnia and seeing a lion. She's scared out of her mind and runs into the forest. She runs so fast that she wears herself out, and she's about to die of thirst when she hears a brook in the distance. And she approaches it and is almost ready to go to the brook when on the grass is the same lion. And the lion speaks to her and says, are you thirsty? Jill says, I'm dying of thirst. The lion says, then drink. May I? Could I? Would you mind going away a little while while I drink, says Jill. And the, answer, the lion answers only by a look and a loud growl. And as Jill great gazes on this lion, she realizes that she might as well have asked the whole mountain to move for her convenience. The noise of the streams was driving her nearly frantic. Will you promise, will you promise not to do anything to me if I come? Says Jill. I make no promises, says the lion. And Jill is so thirsty now that she doesn't realize she takes a step forward. Do you eat girls, Jill says? I have swallowed up girls and boys, women and men, kings and emperors, cities and realms, said the lion. And he didn't say this as he was boasting, but as, and not if he was sorry or angry. He just said it as a fact. I dare not come and drink, said Jill. 
and you will die of thirst, said the lion. Oh dear, said Jill, taking another step closer. I suppose I must go and look for another stream then. There is no other stream, said the lion. It never occurred for Jill to disbelieve the lion. No one had seen his face could do that. Her mind made herself up now. It was the worst thing she had ever would do as she went forward to the stream. She knelt down and began scooping up water in her hand, and it was the coldest, most refreshing water she ever tasted. My friends, don't turn inward in fear like these religious leaders and murder Jesus for the sake of preserving your little kingdom that you built for yourself. What Jesus wants from you is so much bigger and greater than what you would ever want for you. Lay your deadly doing down, down at Jesus' feet, and stand in him alone, gloriously complete. See, the first response we could have when we encounter Jesus is we can run in fear. But there's a second response. And we see that in the sister of Lazarus named Mary. And that response is downward in service. And sorry, this is about Martha. This is the idea of humility and service. And this is a positive response to the glory of Jesus that we see in Martha. Jesus now returns to Bethany, Martha, and Lazarus, um, and Mary's house. And it's only six days before Jesus dies. He's a week away from dying, and he's hanging out with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Look at chapter 12, verse 1. Six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. And they gave a dinner for him there. Martha served. And Lazarus is one of those reclining with him at the table. So Jesus shows up in Bethany. And the people who were there at a funeral just a few days ago now throw him this huge party. There's a celebration going on. Matthew 26 and Mark 14 fill us in with more details that um, John omits. And we find out that the party is at Simon's house. Simon was a man that used to be a leper who was healed by Jesus. And that Mary anoints not just Jesus' head, but he pours, or she pours this whole bottle of perfume on Jesus, and it runs down all the way to his feet. These are stories that we pick up in the other Gospels. Now, when you add up all the people that are there, there's at least minimum of 17 people there. There's Lazarus, the guy that Jesus raised from the dead, hanging out at the table with Jesus. We know the disciples are there, and the disciples have seen the miracles of Jesus over and over. There's Simon, the leper, who's now Simon, the non-leper, because Jesus healed him. And can you imagine being at that table? Imagine the conversations that are going on of people that have encountered the glory of Jesus. And as you pan the room, not, not only do we see the conversation that's going on, but we see this young lady named Martha. And look, Martha's working at the sweat. She's working hard. She's smiling as she wipes the sweat off of her forehead. And this is a completely different countenance from the Martha we encountered last week. Last time we saw her, she was in tears, crying uncontrollably, wondering why Jesus would allow her brother to die. She was in hysteria. Now Martha is calm, cool, collected, serving up in and out burgers to the people hanging out at the table um, at the dinner party. But over in Luke 10, sometime before this story, Martha was in a very similar situation. But that time, Martha was complaining instead of serving. Look at Luke 10 with me. It says, And as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village. And a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And Martha had a sister named Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you're anxious and troubled about many things. But one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. The word distracted there literally means to be pulled and dragged in many directions. Martha is being pictured as dragged around by her many projects and the things that she's doing in the home that Jesus is teaching in. 
And you can see her sweating and thinking to herself, if I don't do this, no one else will. So I have to keep preparing and I have to keep serving and I have to keep doing. And she's convinced herself that true devotion, true Christianity, true discipleship through following Jesus is practical and it's all about service and what she can do for Jesus. It's all about how well she can perform. And she walks into the room where Jesus is teaching and as she looks into the audience, she spots the back of her sister's head. And now she's indignant, she's mad, she's lost her joy. And she bypasses everyone and goes straight up to Jesus and says, Go, tell my sister to help me. And she accuses Jesus of not caring. And almost the same words that she uses in John 11 when Jesus comes and sees as Lazarus and says, She says, Don't you care? Notice in Luke, in the Luke passage, that there's three times Martha says the word me. She comes frustrated. She's so frustrated because she's doing so much for Jesus and no one is noticing it. No one is paying attention. No one is acknowledging what she's doing. Martha apparently thought that the most important thing that we can do is serve Jesus, but that takes away from the glory of Jesus. Because when it's all about what you can do, you become the giver and Jesus becomes the recipient. My friends, God is always the giver. God is the giver. But notice in our passage in John, in John 12, that Martha is at it again. She's serving again. But this time it says she just served. No complaining. No whining. No frustration. No trying to show that she's better than her sister. She's changed. What happened? What caused a change in Martha's life? See, as a result of seeing the glory of God and the value and worth of Jesus at the tomb of her brother, she's now moved from doing things out of obligation to now serving out of joy. You can see this tremendous growth in Martha's life. Now, she's still exercising her gift of service. She knows that's where she's gifted at, to serve, to love, to care for people. And yet now she's doing it out of joy and out of response to the glory and grace of Jesus, instead of trying to get the acknowledgement and praise of people around her, and it changes everything for Martha. This wasn't drudgery. This wasn't an attempt to earn favor with God. This wasn't an attempt to earn Jesus' approval. It was pure joy because she saw the glory of God. Listen, you and I, our motivation for serving is because Jesus is first serving us. The reason that we love our neighbors is because Jesus first loved us. The reason we want people to know about Jesus as good and loving is because Jesus first encountered us. When you see the glory of his service for you at the cross, then you don't serve because you have to, you serve because you want to. Truth be told, true servanthood, true service is only done when it's done in gladness. And this is what Martha has now. Psalm 100 says this, serve the Lord with gladness. Serve the Lord how? With gladness. So can I encourage you, if you come here and you're volunteering somewhere and you're doing it because, oh, because there's no one there and, i got to do it because I'm like the only one there. Jesus isn't pleased with that. Jesus isn't honored with that. Serve him because he served you. Serve him because he's cared for you. Serve him because he has done so much for you. Serve him with gladness. Serve him because you get that privilege, because he has done so much for you. Don't be out of guilt. Don't do it out of like, oh, I have to do this. Do it because he's done so much for you. Love your neighbors because he has loved you. Serve your community because he has served you. Care for people because he has cared for you. Let it flow out of what he's done for you. Don't do it because you're trying to get something from God. You say, how serious is Jesus about serving with him with gladness? Look at this passage in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy. God says, because you did not serve God with joyfulness and out of gladness of heart because of the abundance of things, therefore, 
You will serve your enemies whom the Lord will send against you in hunger and thirst and nakedness, lacking everything. And he will put a yoke of iron on your neck until he's destroyed you. Why is God judging them? He says, you are serving, but you're not serving joyfully. You're not serving with gladness of heart. You're serving because it's being forced on you. You're serving because you feel like you have to do this to get something from me. And there's no joy in it. And because you're not doing it, you're going to experience judgment. Martha responds. She goes from obligation to joyfully serving because she saw the glory of Jesus, not just heard the words of Jesus. Glory and grace changed her. As Jonathan Edwards would say, the Bible is like a path with signs pointing, to, pointing you to the cross where you... To the, pointing you to the ocean where you jump in and enjoy God. But if you only look at the signs, and if you only look at the directions, but you never get to the ocean of God's glory, then you might serve, your serving would only be with drudgery, not with gladness, and not with making much of Jesus. Where's your heart this morning? Have you encountered Jesus where now you say, hey, and Jesus has transformed my life. Now I get to serve him. Now I get to live for him. And I'm not talking about just serving in the church. How do you love your neighbors? How do you, are you a good neighbor? Are you caring for the people in your community? What about at work? Do you just simply go in and do your job? Do you love the people around you? Do you care for them? What about in school? Do you just simply go in and get an education and leave? Do you love your pe the people that God has brought into your life? Are you serving because he served you? Because he's loved you? Because he's cared for you? Number three, upward in adoration. Verse three. Mary therefore took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. So now we pan the room again. We see... Martha serving joyfully the disciples and Jesus and Lazarus and Simon eating and hanging out. And we pan over a little bit more and all of a sudden Mary, who's not standing or sitting at the table, we see Mary at the feet of Jesus. Last time we saw Mary in the previous passage, she was in a bad shape. She was a wreck because her brother had died. But now she's seen the value, the worth, the glory of Jesus. And notice how her life has changed. She's now adoring Jesus. She's worshiping Jesus. She turns upward in her focus. The ointment was used mostly for burial purposes, but notice that Mary doesn't hesitate or pour half of it out and save the others for later. She pours all of the ointment onto Jesus. Mark tells us that she broke the neck of the bottle, implying she pours all of it out. She started on his head, and it runs down all the way to his feet. And the text says that she even uses her own hair to wipe the feet of Jesus. And listen, Jesus may be the Son of God, but I'm sure his feet stinks as well. And yet Mary wipes the feet of Jesus. In Mary, we see humility in being at the feet of Jesus. But we also see delight and value because she wipes his feet with her hair. You say, why is that a big deal? Why? Then she just get a towel or something. This tells us that this is a spontaneous response because Mary didn't plan to do this initially, but she didn't plan this or think through this. She just saw Jesus and she just went into worship. She didn't waste time thinking a lot about it or even stop to get a towel or make sure there was a pan or something to collect all the extra perfume. She just used what she had. She used her hair. And listen, that's a bigger deal than you and I can imagine. Women in that culture did not let their hair down. They always wore their hair up or covered, and the only ones who let their hair down were prostitutes. A modern-day missionary in the Middle East wrote these words. He said, the point that really struck me about Jesus' response to the woman, that it was a complete departure from what was socially acceptable. I'm not sure if one can really begin to grasp how shocking it was unless one has spent enough time in the Middle East for its, for its attitudes to start melding with its own. The worst sin a woman in the Middle East can commit is to lose or to appear have lost her virginity outside of marriage. 
The most important asset of a woman in that culture is her reputation. The whole honor of her family hangs on the reputation of the woman. If a woman has nothing but a reputation as a chaste woman, she always has a chance to succeed. But if she has everything but her reputation, she's lost before she even begins. And in some parts of the Arab world, all it takes for a woman to lose her reputation is to be seen speaking to a man who is not her relative. If a man, particularly a religious man, is known to have even spoken to such a lost woman, her reputation would follow his right down the drain. It's a hard system, and it crosses religious lines. Now consider the same system, but take it back 2,000 years to a lust for giving time. And think about Jesus' encounter with Mary. And that should shock you. You see, Mary was so consumed with her love for Jesus that she didn't care what society said or what customs were. She didn't care what other people thought. Mary had courage and went against the traditions of her day. And when you delight in Jesus' glory and you're secure in him and you find your identity in him, then you will not let fear of what other people think to you stop you from worshiping. Jesus. This is what made the early Christians unstoppable as a missionary force. And this is how you and I got the message today, because they didn't care if they were even going to lose their lives. They were willing to give up their lives so that we could hear the message of the gospel. But notice, Mary also doesn't care about her money or her possessions. She gave to Jesus what was probably the most important, most expensive thing that she owned. You say, how much was this ointment? Well, she, could have, she couldn't have just picked it up at Bath and Body Works, or at Bath and Beyond. That's not where she got it. Just look at Jesus' response, Judas' response. Verse 4, Judas says, Judas says, why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? How much was 300 denarii? It was more than enough money to feed 15,000 people. John 6 says that 200 denarii would have fed the entire crowd that Jesus fed. Today, that would have been almost $10,000. Everything that she has, everything that is hers now belongs to Jesus. She says, Jesus, you're worth more than anything I own. Her money isn't hers anymore. It's Jesus's. He is worth more than anything. And it's only by grace that she has anything. It is only by grace that she now has everything. The cure for you and I from being stingy or greedy is to encounter Jesus. The cure for you and I not to be consumed with money is for us to see the glory of Jesus. First Chronicles says, who am I? And what is my people that we should thus be able to offer willingly? For God, all things come from you and of your own we've given you. Listen, when you give of your tithes and offerings, you're not giving your money. You're giving what God has graciously given you. Of your own, we give you. And here's the irony of this. The same glory can also make you greedy. Next thing, forward in greed. The fourth response that we see is that when you encounter Jesus, you can become very greedy. Verse 4 again, Judas, one of the disciples who was about to betray him, said, why is this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief and having been charged in charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. So here's another response to the vision of God's glory. It's greed. When Judas smelled the ointment, the first thing that flipped in his mind were dollar bills. He tried to make himself look good, and subsequently he tried to make Mary look bad. He wanted to sound like he really was caring. He was like, what about the poor people? What about those who are hurting and struggling? But John says, he's not really concerned about the poor. All he was concerned about was himself. He was like, Mary should have sold that ointment and given it to Jesus so he could have held on to it and taken a little bit for himself. Judas isn't sweet. He only sounds sweet. He only sounds nice. He makes a lot of noise on behalf of his true love, which is other people's money. He wants it for himself. See, sadly, many people will see Jesus on the pages of scripture, and the only thing that comes to their mind is dollar money, dollar bills. 
Paul warns of this many times in the New Testament. Paul says on many occasions that what he's doing, he isn't doing it for money. He doesn't peddle the word of God for money. He never covets other people's money or gold or clothing, he says. And he never uses Jesus as a cloak for greed. First Timothy, he says, people who are depraved in mind and depraved of the truth, imagining that godliness is a gain for truth. In Titus, he says, they must be silenced since they're upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach. People are using this so that they can make themselves rich. And listen, this has happened throughout the history of the church, from the Middle Ages, from the sale of indulgences, which spurred Martin Luther to reform and rebel to cults today that demand fees. Television preachers that preach a prosperity gospel and pro promise prosperity if people would just send them in money. We see this today with people plastering their faces on books with big cheesy smiles and say, hey, read this book and it'll just make you successful and happy and good. There's a lot of money to be made in Christianity because Christians will buy anything that says Jesus on it. Why do people get greedy when it comes to Jesus' glory? Can I be honest? Because they try to find glory, security, and life in money instead of finding it in Jesus. Judas never surrendered to the glory of Jesus. He just wanted to use Jesus for his own gain. But when you surrender to the glory of Jesus, then you don't need to love any money anymore, but you're freely able to give it and use it for God's glory. Hebrews 13 says this way, keep your life from the, from the love of, free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he said, I will never leave you or forsake you. We often use that verse to say, Jesus promises I'll never leave you or forsake you. But the context is, hey, in the context of money, don't worry about money because I promise I will never leave you. I promise I'll never forsake you. I will take care of you. And now in our text, Jesus responds to Jesus and he turns and he uplifts Mary. He rebukes Jesus forcefully. He says, leave her alone. And he quotes scripture. He lays down the law from Deuteronomy. He says, Jesus says, leave her alone. Verse 7 so that she may, be, she may keep it for the day of my burial. The poor you will always have with you, but you don't always have me. He tells Judas, back off, leave her, and leave her alone because she understands what he is about to do. She alone is captured by the beauty of his glory. She was doing something wonderful and glorious in preparing Jesus for his death and burial. So is Jesus downplaying that we shouldn't care for the poor? Is worship of God more important than taking care of the poor? That's the wrong question. Giving to the poor can be an act of worship to Jesus as you demonstrate your hope in Jesus and not your time and talent and treasure. It can also not be an act of worship as you demonstrate your hope in your act of giving. If it's all about what you give instead of how much Jesus has given you, then it can be wrong. Go back and read Deuteronomy 15, and you'll see how if Israel would have obeyed God and kept his laws on giving, there wouldn't have been any people that were poor in the land. Or rather, there were people that were poor in the land because they weren't giving graciously. God was saying, there will always, God was not saying, God, there will always be poor people among you, so just forget about it. He was saying, he was encouraging us to be involved, to be committed. Deuteronomy 15 says, there will always be poor people in the land. Therefore, I command you, to be open-handed with your brothers and toward the poor and needy in the land. Let your heart flow out of generosity, he says. So what's Jesus saying to Judas here? Jesus was not saying, don't do it and just worship him. Rather, he was talking about priority and motivation. He says that once I am your joy and treasure like Mary, you'll want to give of what you have. When I am your joy, when I am your treasure, when I am your delight, you'll want to give. Maybe that's of your time. Maybe that's of your money. Maybe that's of your talent. But when I am what you delight in, you will want to be a blessing to others. When I am what you enjoy, when I am what you worship, when I am what your life is about, You'll want to do good 
for the people around you. As a matter of fact, to say that you come to know Jesus and not have it affect your wallets and your time and your talents and not use it for your God's glory, you need to go back and have a reality check. When you've never opened up your homes because you're more concerned about how well your home looks, instead of inviting people in and loving and feeding and caring for them, you have a reality check. When you never care for people because you're more concerned about your own self instead of what Jesus wants, you have a reality check. Jeremiah 22, he judges the cause of the poor and the needy, and it was, well, is this not new to me, declares the Lord? Listen, Mary's giving of her money and possession to Jesus and giving to the poor can both be acts of worship, responses to the glory of Jesus. Both are part of the mission, two wings on the same plane. When you give, you are doing all of this. And to be stingy and hoardy with your money to advance God's kingdom makes you more like Judas and less like Mary. All right, last one. The last thing that we see as a response to the glory of Jesus is you become outward in mission. Verse 9. When the large crowd of the Jews heard that Jesus was there, they came not only on account of him, but also to see Lazarus whom he raised from the dead. So the chief priest made plans to put Lazarus to death as well, because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. Jesus wasn't the only one popular now. There was a new kid on the block. Lazarus was going everywhere and saying, look at Jesus, look at Jesus. And people came to hear Jesus and also to hear Lazarus. And who wouldn't want to hear Lazarus? Lazarus, what was it like being dead? What was it like to come out of the tomb, right? And Lazarus couldn't keep his mouth shut. He was so excited to tell people about Jesus. He was talking so much about Jesus that the religious leaders now wanted to kill Lazarus as well. They planned, they began the conversation by saying, let's kill Jesus. And by the end of it, they were like, let's kill Jesus and everyone that follows Jesus, including Lazarus. People were turning to Jesus left and right because of Lazarus. You know, there's nothing more attractive than when you and I are absolutely satisfied in Jesus. When you and I are overwhelmed by his glory. Lazarus has seen and experienced the glory of Jesus, and he knows that there is nothing greater. So he wants others to know, not for his sake, but for Jesus' sake. And only when you go from telling people about Jesus for the sake of And only when you go from telling people about Jesus for the sake of acceptance to the fact of being accepted will you be effective. People who talk about God in order to earn favor from God or to make up for sin or to fulfill their religious obligation, they're bad news for the team. They're angry. They're feisty. They're compulsive. They're judgmental. They don't care about people. They just want to do something. They're not captured by Jesus' glory and grace, but rather by their own glory. But when you're captured by Jesus, you love on people, and you know that people are fallen because you yourself are fallen. And you love them, you care for them, you embrace them. I ask you, how do you see Jesus? How do you look at him? Do you look at Jesus, and do you turn inward in fear and run? Do you go forward in greed? Do you look at Jesus as someone, like a good luck charm and saying, oh, I've got Jesus, so now I've got to be successful in everything because I pray or I do good stuff? So are you like Martha? Do you, out of overflow because of what Jesus has done for you, you say, hey, he served me, I get to serve. Are you like Mary? Man, I've encountered Jesus, and all I want to do is worship him. I want to give him my time. I want to give him my money. I want to give him my possessions. And I just want to worship. Are you outward in mission? Do people know that you love Jesus? Do people know that Jesus has changed your life? Listen, um, you can't expect to see Jesus on your morning pancake or a face in a cloud or some other weird, random, weird thing and get excited to serve him. The only way you're going to get excited about Jesus is you diving into the word and meditating and looking and encountering Jesus. Every story whispers his name. 
Every story is pointing to him. He's like the missing piece of the puzzle, the piece that makes all the other pieces come together and allows you to see a beautiful picture. He is the Swiss Alps that you look at through the Bible, not just a painting on a wall. He is beautiful. He is glorious. He's worthy. Have you encountered him? Some of you have been hearing this over and over And if you're not careful, if you don't respond, your heart will get hard and callous. You'll miss the fact that Jesus is here this morning, and you'll miss him. Are you responding in worship? Are you responding in service? Are you responding in mission? This is our chance to respond as we come to the table, take time to reflect and think about why you come to the table this morning that are here. There's bread, there's juice representing the body and blood of Jesus that Jesus told us to do in remembrance of him. So would you remember him this morning? Even now, would you remember him right now? Would you repent over seeing the glory of God in the face of Jesus in scripture and just simply yawning at it and making much making it making taking it lightly would you repent of not serving Jesus with gladness would you repent of being stingy and greedy with your time your talents your treasures all of us in this room if we're honest need to repent all of us really don't serve the way, serve out of gratitude and love. We serve often out of obligation. We give because we taught that, we're taught that's what we have to do. And we share the gospel because that's what we feel like we have to do. But are we doing it because we've been captured by Jesus? Are you captured by him? Has Jesus taken your heart? And so over time, um, so it would be really nice if he was not able to take his time, but um, would you spend some time meditating? Would you reflect on your own heart this morning? Has Jesus captured your heart? If not, would you this morning, would you just spend some time? Would you speak to him? Would you encounter him? Would you repent of things in your life that's holding you back from pursuing him? And then, out of your love for him, would you come to the table, grab the elements that represent his body and his blood, and joyfully would you celebrate communion knowing that he has paid the price for you. He's forgiven you. He's accepted you. He has made you a part of his family.